Welcome everyone to House on Worth Los Angeles. My name is Alexander Barrera, the events manager here at, at the gallery. I just wanted to take a quick moment to welcome the beautiful community here and the exhibitors to Lit Lit 2022. Um, and just give some love to our next introducer, uh, extraordinaire Irene Yoon. She is the executive director of LARB, the soul and heart of LARB, I was told. So just wanted to give her some extreme love today because she has been incredible alongside Kelly to help us make Lit Lit happen. So I'm gonna pass it over to her. Thank you so much, Alexander. And thank you so much to everyone here at Hauser & Worth um, for providing this beautiful space and being such wonderful partners in making this event possible. I also want to do a quick shout out to Kelly Payton, our amazing public programs director, who's really been the heart and soul behind this particular event. And yeah, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you all to this conversation on the art of translation. Um, we are also very much indebted to the Center for the Art of Translation and the wonderful team there, including Michael Holtman and Leslie Ann Woofter. Um, we're so excited that they were able to come down and join us from the Bay and to help us put together this really wonderful conversation, which I'm very excited for. Um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Michael very quickly to <laughs> say a few words. We're all just going to pass it up. Everyone here is going to have to, to say some words. I'll be quick. I'm from the Center for the Art of Translation. I'm the director. Uh, it's based in San Francisco. We have a small press here called Two Lines Press. I'm the publisher of as well. So if you're interested in literature and translation, I know we're not the only press that showcases literature and translation, but you can take a stroll and say hi. Uh, thank you, everyone here, for joining us. Uh, I feel really strongly about the art of translation and, and am uh, not just an advocate, but, you know, to, to the bone, I feel like everyone needs to know about the art of translation. You get to talk to these, hear from these incredible translators we've invited here today from all across the country and even in from Mexico City. Um, so I'm going to turn it back to Irene. Just thank you for joining us. We celebrate translation and uh, the voices that we hear from other parts of the world that I feel are so important for us to hear right now. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. We're so, so excited to be able to partner with the Center for the Art of Translation and sharing this really um, strong value for, the, for how incredibly powerful and meaningful it is to be able to engage with works of literature from all over the world. Um, over the past decade, as many of you may, may know, the Los Angeles Review of Books has really put a high premium on exactly this work and really fought for the visibility of its practitioners um, by, by you know, reviewing and publishing works by translators from really dozens of countries and languages all over the world. So we're really excited about this particular conversation today. Um, and today we're also really thrilled to announce that we are going to be launching a new residency. Um, it's going to be a, a partnership. It's between LARB and Yefe Knopf Translation. Um, we're going to be um, opening up a contest on August 15th for emerging translators from, um, of prose from any language. The idea is that the winning translator will have the opportunity to complete and polish the translation of a short story um, in consultation with our editor-in-chief and longtime literary translator, Boris Jeliuk. Um, you'll get to do this while spending two weeks at Yefeinov's beautiful cottage up in Lake Arrowhead in December. And so stay tuned for more details on that. We'll be announcing um, and opening up the applications for that on August 15th. So you can find out more at lareviewofbooks.org. Um, we actually do have a brief recording from Gil Soltz, the uh, head of Yefeinov, who wasn't able to join us today, but wanted to send a quick message. So... Bonjour. Shalom. My name is Gil Soltz. I'm the founder of the Yefenov Residency. Wherever we go in the world, we find minds that have evolved as a result of geography, history, and culture, and yet we still fail to fundamentally understand each other. Is it a question of language, a matter of meaning attached to symbols? Hello. Bonjour. Translators have given us the world's minds, and the greatest amongst them deliver the subtlety of transmission. Yefinov was founded to honor my father as an unknown author of thousands of stories of hope that have never been recorded, let alone translated. He was an immigrant to the United States who had his own clever vernacular and often read in his native language. We are honored to partner with the LA Review of Books and bring this announcement to you at LitLit. Lit. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. We look forward to hosting your work, which will no doubt help us see ourselves through another system of experience. The woods are lovely in the days before winter really sets in, and one emerging translator will have this all to themselves, 
80 miles, 130 kilometers from where you're now sitting at Yefenov. I'm hugely thankful to Irene, Kelly, Boris, and Larb for the opportunity to make this announcement in my own words. And I hope you apply. Best of luck. Wonderful. So um, without further ado, <laughs> it's my great pleasure now to introduce the moderator of today's conversation, Magdalena Edwards. Magdalena is a writer, actor, and translator from Spanish and Portuguese. We've been so thrilled and lucky to have her as a contributing editor here at LARB, and her work has appeared not only in our pages, um, but also those of the Paris Review, the Boston Review, the Millions, the London Review of Books, and many, many more. Um, her translations include the works of Clarice Lispector, Julio Cortazar, uh, Raul Zurita, Nicanor Parra, Noemi Jaffe, um, uh, Marcia Tiburi, Silviana Santiago, and Oscar Cantardo. Her essay, The Body Speaks, Clarice Lispector on screen, will appear in the forthcoming volume after Clarice, Reading Lispector's Legacy in the 21st Century, which is edited by Ariana X. Jacobs and Claire Williams. We're so honored to have Magdalena join us in moderating this conversation, and all of these really wonderful, brilliant translators as well. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you. It's so nice to be gathering again in person. A uh, couple of things that have come up for me already in terms of translation from these introductions and um, the, the words that we heard recorded that were doubled is this idea of doubling. And when you translate, you carry something from one language into another, but of course it's not a photocopy, it's different. Um, and you travel. Translation is a way of traveling. So I'd like to travel with each of our panelists today. Um, and my first question is, well, please introduce yourself, tell us your name, tell us a little bit about you, and tell us how did you get into translating? And tell us about your first book-length translation project. We go in this order. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Bruna. I translate Brazilian literature from Portuguese into English. Um, I first came into translation as a way to um, not forget about one of myself. Um, I came from Brazil to college in Vermont and I was studying English and some French literature, you know, reading Flaubert and Harry James and then going to creative writing classes where we read best American short stories of the century or anything. It felt like my Brazilianness or my past or my childhood was locked away and I had somehow lost the key. Um, and then reading these beautiful books that I made my mom mail me, and it took forever to arrive, um, I just felt like speaking Portuguese did something for me than make me a foreigner or make me have an accent. Um, it was a really beautiful experience. I loved reading all the books, and I loved that I carried this secret now, that I loved these authors that no one knew, um, and that I knew them. I mean, of course, a whole country and continents worth of people knew them, but in Vermont, I, <laughs> I knew them. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then I, I took a, a translation class. I had a wonderful teacher who was encouraging, who saw that um, my foreignness could be an asset and not a liability. That felt rare back then. It felt special. So I kind of held on to that, and I continued doing my other things. I continued hearing, reading lots in Harry James for whatever reason, um, mostly because my class is required. Uh, <laughs> But then I also started translating this book called Moldy Strawberries uh, that was published in Brazil 40 years ago, 1982, by Caio Fernando Abreu. And it was a book about the AIDS crisis and the military dictatorship in Brazil and a lot of longing and loneliness and being alone in apartments, listening to Pink Floyd in the middle of the night, getting a little high and feeling kind of sorry for yourself and then also excited that you're alive despite all odds. Um, it just, it felt right. And then after I graduated, there, a few more years would go by where I didn't know how one published anything or how copyright worked. And then I figured it out and the book now exists in the world. I forgot to bring my copy <laughs> with me, <laughs> but it exists. Um, and I couldn't be happier that everyone now gets to read this book in English. The author is no longer with us. He died of AIDS in 1994. Um, but I, I, would, I, I think he would be thrilled to see that the words live on, um, that, the, that the AIDS crisis didn't kill the literature that he and his 
gears were producing, which was exactly their goal. That's amazing, and I love that title, Moldy Strawberries. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Myers. I'm a translator of poetry and prose from Spanish. Um, and I began translating as a sort of intersection of two other passions that I couldn't figure out how they were going to interact with each other. One was poetry in, in general. I started writing poetry, became completely obsessed with poetry as a, as a teenager. Um, and also with the Spanish language for a very specific personal reason, which is that my paternal grandmother was from Mexico, from northern Mexico. And I never met her. She died a long time before I was born. But my, my father has, this, has a deep love of Mexico and curiosity about Mexico. And that is what was passed on to me, was, was, was love and curiosity. Um, and so I had this sense um, from a young age that, that Mexico was where I was most drawn as a place to be, as a place to build my life, which is what has sort of accidentally ended up happening. Um, and when I moved to Mexico City in the way that one does occasionally to make a big decision without having any idea <laughs> what you're going to do. I was in my early 20s, as one is, and um, I needed to make a living. And so, of course, very practical, I will become a literary translator, um, which I didn't also. Initially, I translated sort of anything that moved, um, you know, technical documents. I was wildly unqualified to translate um, anything. <laughs> it, was, it was a rough time. Um, and eventually, um, I, I, kept, I kept translating, um, or, or began translating, really, um, some of the young Mexican poets that I was beginning to meet and, and befriend in Mexico City. Um, and so it was both a sort of a sense of, of becoming oriented where I was, where I was trying to, to make my new life. Um, it was a sort of exercise of friendship, of getting to know in an intimate way the people that I was connecting with as, as people, as friends. Um, and, and it became also just a sort of apprenticeship of, um, of Mexican Spanish, of Mexico City Spanish, because there is no, no such thing as, as any one language. We're always learning the language from where we are and who we're with. Um, and, and from there, I started um, also in a kind of haphazard way from Mexico City trying to figure out how to work on longer works of both poetry and prose and place them with, with presses in the United States, um, which has been a long, a long and winding road. Um, and my first book-length translation, which came out in 2018, was a book of poetry called Lyric Poetry is Dead. Spoiler alert, it isn't. Um, and it's by the Argentine poet Ezequiel Seidenberg. Um, it was published by Cardboard House Press. And part of what was really beautiful about that for me as a first experience is that Ezekiel was, was my teacher, is, is still in a way my teacher. He's, he was, I, I studied for a semester in Buenos Aires and took um, a translation, a poetry translation workshop with him. And we've become good friends and colleagues over the years and we have each translated each other. And so it was this, for me a sort of a way of, of a culmination of a relationship that had, had, remains a sort of pillar of my personal and professional life. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Leong. I'm a translator from Japanese into English. I wanted to pick up the thread about um, translation as a process of, of learning. Um, my first book length project started out as a learning or relearning project for um, relearning my, my uh, mother's language, Japanese. Um, so I uh, was also in, in college in a very cold New Hampshire place across the river uh, from Vermont and uh, decided to apply to grad school because I thought that they would pay for me to travel to other countries and learn languages. Um, and so I proposed this really ambitious project far beyond my linguistic capabilities. I said that I would learn Portuguese, I would improve my Spanish, and that my Japanese was good enough to do a comparative literature project in it, which would be like a three-country project, Peru, Brazil, Japan, United States. I would look at diasporic poetry of haiku and senryu across all those countries. And of, of course, that proved to be logistically impossible because haiku and senryu as extremely limited forms require you to have a very broad cultural context to understand what 17 syllables mean. So I, I reformulated this and, and um, decided to turn to prose and started looking at Japanese American literature in the United States written in Japanese. And this was difficult. Um, this was an area of literature that many scholars hadn't yet looked at. 
bibliographies were kind of scarce other than a, a UCLA project in the 1970s. Um, and uh, there was one copy of, of the book that became Lament in the Night in the UC Berkeley Library, so I picked that up. My Japanese language ability at that time was maybe second year, and so I was reading this book because it had phonetic guides to the characters along the sides because it was written before 1946 when it was really common for uh, given what literacy levels were for reading Japanese characters to provide phonetic guides, which uh, made it an easier project to start with, although it has continued to affect the way that I speak Japanese. The last time I did an oral proficiency exam, somebody said, why do you speak like you're from the 1930s? Why are you using so many Chinese compounds? Like all this is partly due to the fact that I, I learned or relearned Japanese through the lens of 1920s immigrant Japanese literature. So I uh, picked that up and uh, over the course of four to five years, uh, revised, corrected some egregious mistakes that I had made in my like learner's translation of the text, and then uh, spoke to the folks at Kaya Press, uh, who gave me a contract to do this, and then said, you know, do some additional research. You can write an introduction. As part of that research, I also found one other serialized novel that the author Nagahara Shoson had written in the Rafa Shimpo, which is and still is. Um, one of the largest Japanese American, Japanese language, English language, bilingual dailies in, uh, in the United States. I'm based in Los Angeles, this offer, offices are just uh, down the street. Um, that was a 147 installment serialized novel that I agreed to translate, but that took an additional two years. So uh, it, it's really two books combined into one as my first book length project. Thank you so much. Uh, a, a lot of important themes, I think, have come up here that include um, connection, reclaiming, relearning, discovery, uh, being in contact with our ancestors or our past and our histories, and also relationships, friendships. There's a, a phrase or a term that I, that I like to use that I call translationship, so relationships between writer translators or poet translators, and I love that you and your teacher have translated each other. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on Elizabeth Bishop, and she translated a lot of contemporaries, including Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet, and he translated her. Um, and that's kind of like a delicious way of entering into contact with someone. So um, I'd like to ask each of you to bring us into contact with some of your translation by reading for us. And um, that also brings me to music and rhythm and the flow of language. And so, um, take it away. Bruno, please. Okay, I will be reading from my phone, but... <laughs> you, sorry about that. But you can uh, definitely read a, a paper copy um, if you'd like. Uh, this was published by Archipelago Books. The name of the story is Beyond the Point. It was raining, raining, raining and I was going into the rain to meet him, no umbrella or anything. I was always losing them in bars. I was holding just a bottle of cheap cognac tight against my chest. Hard to believe it said this way, but that was how I was going through the rain. A bottle of cognac in hand and a wet pack of cigarettes in my pocket. At one point I could have taken a cab, but it wasn't very far away, and if I took a cab I couldn't buy cigarettes or cognac. I thought hard. It would be better to get wet because then we could drink the cognac. It was cold, not that cold. It was more the dampness seeping through the fabric of my clothes, through the holes in the thin soles of my shoes, and we would smoke, would drink without limit. There would be music, always those hoarse voices, that moaning sax, his eye having settled on me, the warm shower loosening my muscles. But it was still raining. My eyes burned from the cold, my nose started dripping. I would wipe it with the back of my hand and the snot would harden quickly over my nose hairs. I shoved my reddened hands deep into my pockets and I was going, I was going, jumping over puddles with frigid legs, so frigid my legs and my arms and my face that I thought of opening the bottle to have a sip, but I didn't want to get to his house half drunk, breath stinking. I didn't want him to think that I'd been drinking and I had been every day a good excuse. And I was also thinking that he would think I was broke, arriving on foot in all that rain, and I was, stomach aching with hunger. And I didn't want him to think I hadn't been sleeping, and I hadn't. 
dark circles under my eyes. I would have to be careful with my lower lip when smiling, if I smiled, and I almost certainly would when I saw him, so that he wouldn't see the broken tooth and think I'd been letting myself go, and I had been, avoiding the dentist, and everything I'd done and been, I didn't want him to see or know, but thinking that gave me a heartache because I was realizing in the rain that maybe I didn't want him to know that I was me, and I was. A confusing thing started to happen in my head. This idea of not wanting him to know I was me, soaked in that rain that kept falling, falling, falling. I wanted to go back to some place warm and dry, if there was such a place, and I couldn't remember any, or stay right there forever in that gray intersection I was trying to cross but didn't. The cars splashing rainwater and mud on me as they passed, but I couldn't, or I could have but shouldn't have, or I could have but didn't want to or didn't know how how to stop or turn back, I had to keep going to meet him. He would open the door for me, the moaning sacks in the background and maybe a fireplace, pine nuts, old wine with cinnamon and cloves, those winter things, and even more. I had to stop the urge to turn back or stand still because there is a point I was realizing. When you lose control of your own legs, not exactly, but the slow realization that the cold and the rain wouldn't even let me chew properly. I was beginning to learn that there is a point and I was torn, wanting to see beyond that point and also the pleasure of him waiting for me hot and ready. A car came closer and drenched me completely. A river would come out of my clothes if I wrung them. So I decided in my head that after opening the door, he would say something like, look how wet you are, with no astonishment, because he was expecting me, he was calling me. I was only going because he was calling me. I dared. I was going beyond the point of staying still, now through the path of leafless trees and the dead-end street I was seeing again in that strange way of having already been there without having been. I hesitated, but I was going through the middle of the city, like an invisible thread coming out of his head up to mine. Whoever saw me wet like this couldn't see our secret, only saw a wet guy without a raincoat or umbrella, just a bottle of cheap cognac tied against his chest. It was me he was calling through the city, pulling the thread from my head to his, in the rain. It was for me that he would open his door, getting very close now, so close I felt a warmth rise up to my face as if I drunk out the cognac. He would change my wet clothes for drier ones and would softly take my hand in his, caressing them slowly to warm them, chasing away the purple of my cold skin. It was that getting dark. It was still early, but it was getting dark early, earlier than usual and it wasn't even winter. He would make a large bed with lots of blankets, and it was then that I slipped and fell, all of a sudden. And to protect the bottle, I squeezed it against my chest and hit a rock. And besides rainwater and mud from the cars now, my clothes were also soaked in cognac, like a drunk, stinky. We wouldn't drink it then. I tried to smile, gently, my lower lip almost motionless, hiding the stump of my tooth, and I thought of the mud he would wipe off tenderly because it was me he was calling, because it was me he was choosing, because it was for me and only for me he would open his door. It kept raining and it took me a long time to get up from that puddle of mud. I was getting to a point, I was returning to the point in which an effort so great was necessary, an effort so great was needed, an effort so awful was required that I had to stop even more to myself and invent something more, warming up my secret. And I took a few steps. But how does one do it, I wondered. How does one do this thing of placing one foot in front of the other, balancing the head over the shoulders, keeping the spine erect? I was unlearning. It was nearly nothing, me being held only by that invisible thread attached to my head. Now so close that I wanted to, that if I wanted to, I could imagine something like a, an electronic buzz coming out of his head until it reached mine. But how does one do it? I was always relearning and inventing, always toward him to arrive whole, the pieces of me all mixed up. He would lay them out unhurriedly, as if playing with a puzzle to form what castle, what forest, what warmer god I didn't know. But I was going in the rain because that was my only reason, my only destination, pounding on that dark door I was pounding on now. And I pounded, and I pounded on it again, and pounded once more, and I kept pounding on it, not caring that people in the street stopped to look. I wanted to call him, but I'd forgotten his name. That is, if he'd ever had one at all. Maybe I had a fever. Everything was very confusing. Ideas mixed up. 
shivering, rainwater and mud and cognac pounding, and it still hadn't stopped raining. But I, was going, I wasn't going in the rain anymore through the city. I was just standing by that door for a long time beyond the point. So dark now that I would never be able to find my way back or try another idea, another action, another gesture beyond pounding, 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 pounding on the same door that never opens. <laughs> Thank you, I'm out of breath now. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to read one poem from this book called The Dream of Every Cell by a Mexican poet named Maricela Guerrero. Um, and just for a tiny bit of background, it's a book of both, I would call it a sort of eco-feminist praise protest poem. <laughs> um, it's, it's a book concerned with both the, the forces that continue to ravage the earth and our communities, and at the same time, it's, it's a sort of series of reimaginings of other ways to cohabit with um, both human and non-human presences. Um, there are a bunch of sort of recurring characters throughout uh, the poems. One is um, a, an elementary school teacher named Ms. Olmedo, um, who teaches her students how to classify plants and how to draw them. Um, so it's also about sort of our systems of, of knowledge, of how we, of the language we use uh, to communicate, to categorize, to learn. Um, there is a, a, a wolf, a mother wolf, who reappears. Um, I won't say much more, but just, that, just for context that in these poems, there are these elements that sort of speak to each other, um, like cells speaking to each other in an organism. And this poem is called Fear. Let's go back to the fear of subtraction. It said that if they come for us, we won't even realize it. It said that if they come for us, I won't even try to look for you. It said that they'll come for us and we'll each be carried off alone. It's like the movie about the clownfish. It's like the movie about the little girl who goes looking for her mother in the company of an alien. It's like how in E.T., when my dad stayed with me in the theater while my mom took my brother outside to calm him down. It's like the time I thought she wasn't coming back. It's like the times I was terrified that my dad would get abducted by aliens when he went out drinking and I'd never see him again. It's like the time I told my mom her dress was ugly and she didn't pick me up from school. It's like the bird who twists her foot while having an adventure with a boy scout and an old man and her baby chicks keep cheep cheeping to her in the distance. It's like every place where open pit mining creates desolate wastelands. It's like the workers' housing units and construction plots that haven't been paid off and are left scattered with empty rooms. I know it's cold, that it's as frightening as when you reach out and touch some viscous, grimy substance instead of a warm, familiar hand. I know there's something to be done inside that space, that maybe it's worth feeling through the fear together, collecting it, taking samples of fear for careful study, embracing fear until it curls up beside us and falls asleep. There's a light by your bed, a succulent plant, in oxygen, in vine, in air, in wolf. There's an entire language of enzymes and biomolecules beyond and within, shared breath and dreams of cells becoming cells. Cells, it's always about cells, about breath, exchange, reproduction, differentiation. The animal's asleep beside your bed. It snorts. I have a hunch that there was room for everyone. Thanks. Um, I'm going to make this audience choose your own adventure. So you have your choice of flowers or death. And I'll, I'll go once again by crowd uh, consensus. So flowers or death, take your pick. Flowers. OK. Death. That's a good way to take the temperature of a room <laughs> or an outdoor space. OK, this is from uh, Lament in the Night. It's set in downtown uh, Los Angeles. So uh, appropriate and uh, a summer moment. Uh, protagonist's name is Sakuzo. Soon enough, Sakuzo's days of hunger and boredom returned. His ashen face grew even more drawn, and his eyes fluttered listlessly thin as threads. 
Lacking the energy to do anything else, all he could do was wander aimlessly around the city, his hands stuffed in the pockets of his khakis. After wake, uh, walking himself to the point of exhaustion, he would end up on some grimy stool in a dimly lit pool hall, or on a bench in a sun-drenched park on the outskirts of the city. Since he didn't have money for food, he would go to restaurant after run, restaurant and run off without paying the check. When he wasn't able to pull off an eat and run, he would go at night to the public market and pick up rotting apples and oranges that had been tossed to the ground. No doubt about it, he was living the life of a beggar. His health was getting worse. His stomach ached constantly. There were days when all he could do was lie in bed in his sunless room. His malnourished state set all of his nerves on edge. Everything he heard or saw sent him into a rage. His days of hunger continued relentlessly. It was already fall. The sky above the Southern Californian city was crystal blue, and a cool breeze rustled through the trees. Everything was wrapped in an air of tranquility. It was a time of year when everyone moved as if drunk on the sweet wine of nature's splendor. Sakuzo alone lamented the coming of fall, cursing his plight. Everything he saw, everything he heard, filled him with grief and anguish. If only he could have just a little bit of happiness. But no, he couldn't even taste the small share of happiness owed to every human being. He began to doubt whether he had ever known hope, happiness, whether happiness even existed. He had fallen so far that he feared he would never be able to escape the bitter sadness he felt. In his despair, he realized that he didn't even feel like trying to get back up again. He tried again and again to break away from the sordid path his life had taken, and now he was finished, exhausted to the core of his being. If his past and present were nothing but empty dreams, then what good could come from such weariness and despair? If the souls of the dead are reborn from the graveyards of torment, suffering, and defeat, then what bright promise might lie in Sakuzo's future? Only death. The only thing waiting for him was the dark red specter of death. So I have several more questions for you three, but we're going to open up to audience questions soon. So if you do have a question, um, formulate it as such, please, not as a comment. And before we get to that, before we open it up to all of you, I'm going to ask one more question for now. Um, and that is this. Um, how do you approach translation in terms of creativity and technique? Um, and I'm, I'm particularly curious about moments of sarcasm or humor or irony, if that speaks to you. But if not, it could be another type of moment. For me, I think I approach a lot through the um, affective experience. Like I try to capture the emotions while also capturing the music. For me, both rhythm, well, specifically with this book too, uh, the music of the prose was very important. You know, the ups and downs, the climaxes, the crescendos, that was important. But it also had this emotional um, load that needed to be deeply felt. So when it was funny, it needed to be funny. When it was scary, it needed to be scary. Both at the level of the sentence, you know, but also uh, throughout the book, it had an arc of its own. So both the micro and the macro. Um, so I would jot down in the margins, like this uh, was spooky, this was uncanny, this was eerie, this was funny. And in my translation, I would compare notes if the, the, you know, the feeling was somewhat similar. Because of course the prose, the style, all of that is incredibly difficult to do, but in many ways I studied that. Um, but the humanity of the book, the emotions of the book, the sc school somehow didn't touch on that. Uh, I think <laughs> I had to bring that to the table through my own experiences, you know. I might not be uh, a gay man dying of AIDS, but I know sorrow, I know longing, and I would, much like an actor, you're an actor, you know, and I would bring that into the text that way. Oh, absolutely. I love the idea of the translator as a kind of performer. So I'm just going to leave that there for now. Thank you, Robin. I am also very 
interested in the idea of translation as, a, as an interpretive art, as a performance art, um, and I think in, in translation of any genre, but thinking about poetry also as, as a sort of cover art um, and, and about engaging um, with, with a score, with a melodic line in such a way that it's invariably going to change and take on new textures, and that is in fact the point, is that it changes and it becomes also something else. Um, as far as technique, um, and I, I, I really like what you said, Bruno, about the sort of the effective Ex affective experience um, and I, I think a lot about the sort of tools of, of poetry, of engaging with poetry as a sort of continual um, reminder that language is stuff, it's a material thing I thought that was a bee, there are two flies Yeah, um, that you use and shape um, and it is always showing you how it's working and so I think um, when it comes to to emotional texture, um, I think a lot about the ways that the, the textures affectively of Spanish and the textures of English um, use often different materials to get at an, a shared experience. Um, and so I think something like, um, Magdalene, you've asked about irony and sarcasm and humor, which is, which is tricky always. I think humor is just this sort of elevated level of human communication in general. Um, but, you know, just thinking a lot about the sort of the, the textures available in the English language, the hard edges, the sort of consonant heavy um, words that we have as resources. Um, I also, I guess, would say in this, in, in the in the realm of, of interpretation and music and rhythm, I read aloud a lot, even in translating prose. Um, I find it es especially, actually, with, I mean, always I do it, but with um, things like humor, I think it's so much easier for the ear to determine whether a, a joke lands or whether a sort of biting comment bites um, if you hear it in your ear than if you read it on the page. So I'm, I'm a sort of obsessive um, re-reader of, of, um, of really any translation as a way to sort of feel that in a physical sense is what the language is doing. This thing about reading out loud also um, resonates it and it's a great way to catch error in in capturing tone or other moments i've been translating a, a play by um, nagahara and uh, by having actors go through a stage reading of it it's immediately clear where something doesn't land emotionally and usually when that happens it's because i've made a mistake in the translation or didn't quite get something um, right uh, in, in terms of the the element about sarcasm and humor that is also uh, something that uh, took me a, a, a while to get. I mean, I, I kind of had to read a book called Emotional Expressions in Japanese <laughs> because um, <laughs> th there's all kinds of bullshit that, that shows up in, in textbooks which are or organized around making you a polite, good speaking subject and like telling you things like everybody always speaks at this level of politeness. If you don't, it could be really offensive, but of course, in literary range, people are rude, mean, swear, curse, talk about sex acts all the time, even though the textbook would have you believe that none of these things are imaginable possibilities. So um, I, I found that a, a good clue in, in some of the texts that I've, I've worked with is that when people get drunk, it's a good sign that like the emotional walls and barriers start to come, come loose and things will become more humorous or, or dirtier. Um, and I, I, the example that, that comes to mind is, this is also a problem of cross-contamination as a, a translator. So there was this phrase that I was trying to translate, which was, um, bungaku no bu wa shiranai hito. So like, does not understand or does not know the bu of bungaku or the bu of literature. And I couldn't figure out what the boo was. And because I was taking a lot of critical theory classes, I was like, people who do not understand the negation of literature, like boo as like a, a root radical for literature. But it, it, it's actually a joke about they don't understand the sound boo of bungaku, like the first <laughs> boo of bungaku, or people that don't understand the letter L of literature, right? Like, which kind of works in, in English. But I, I completely missed this until. I had a glass of wine, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's what this is, right? So part of it is like doubling the emotional state of, of the writer in order to figure out what, what's going on with the text. That's amazing, because translators never overcomplicate things, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
So we're going to open up for questions now. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and we have a mic that will travel. Thank you, all of you. This has been amazing. Um, I wanted to ask if there have been moments when you're reading um, a piece that you're going to translate, and you have. I think I, I don't know, and I'm not a professional translator of any sort. So I'm, I, I wonder: Are there moments of like sorrow or grief where you're like, "There's no way to literally convey the original exact intent because humor doesn't translate, or um, there's this concept doesn't exist in the language I'm translating to"? Could you talk about like, is that a thing of a, a moment of grief where you lose a specific detail of what you're trying to translate? And, and could you share? And I, this isn't directed to anyone in particular, but if someone would like to share a moment like that. I'm really curious about that. Um, I don't know if we should go in order again, but I really liked what Robin said about the fabric sometimes being different to achieve a, a similar uh, result. So if brief, uh, the English language behaves in certain ways, maybe say this language is more prudish than that one, you know, it's perfectly fine to use the, to modulate the doll, to shape it the way it has to be. And it's okay if the humor is a little different. It doesn't have to be the exact same. The effect needs to be similar on the imagined reader, but mostly that imagined reader is me. <laughs> on my body, I need to feel right. Um, so, uh, Essentially, no, there's never something that I feel like can't be carried over. It, it might just have to be carried over in a way that fits this language better or that fits the, the tone or the, the tools of the language better. There are different opportunities for writing just in the way that words are shaped. And I try to take advantage of those. I'm like, this um, alliteration here isn't in the original, but it's an opportunity in English and I'm going to take it. Uh, you know, and then I make beautiful writing for beautiful writing, kind of loosely that way. Um, but also the playfulness sometimes just comes from being really open, like getting drunk or <laughs> one glass of wine. Forgive me. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> that was hyperbole. So <laughs> uh, but also being creative. I remember once a character uh, who was really sick. Uh, he'd been uh, HIV positive for a little while. And his, his dog was also sick, and the dog was an important character in the story. And the mother says he has a dog cough, which is a Portuguese expression for when the, the cough sounds heavy, um, your lungs are full. And I'm like, oh, God damn it, what am I going to do here? And then I'm like, okay, he's sick as a dog. There you go. I have the dog, he's sick. It doesn't have to be a cough exactly. I have to think about the, the main point as opposed to the words. The point was that his sickness was mirrored by this dog. So I think about that a lot. I'm like, okay, the, what, the meaning here, not of the words, like the soul you know, being conveyed, is that this person feels lonely and he is at the beach. So I'm gonna make it that way. You know, I tried to paint this scene uh, with the, the tools I got and then there you go, you have a scene. I, I do experience that grief sometimes. And for me, it mostly, I'm, I'm struggling to think of, of a specific concise example, but often when there is um, wordplay in a way that feels just sort of absolutely central to getting an emotional gist across, um, and sometimes that can happen in such a sort of perfect kind of self-contained way that it's, it's, it, there is this sense of like, there's just not a way I can make it happen in, in this way. But I think like Bruna is saying, I often think of it, especially in poetry, as a sort of, as an as an excuse for for rearrange to thinking about the part, the relationship between the parts and the whole, um, and often sort of displacing a moment uh, like that onto something else. And so it, there won't be a sort of this this kind of compulsory, this one to one correspondence, but it's the sense of how um, to make something happen in a different moment. I'm actually thinking of an example that that isn't mine. It has to do with a poet that I've also translated named Dolores Dorantes, and. And um, there's an essay, the book is called Style in English, and it has to do with femicides and disappearances of women in Ciudad Juarez, um, and also the sort of the, the, the working culture of the, of the factories on the border. 
And her translator of that book named Jen Hoffer wrote in her translator's note about a word that she uses a lot, which is mina. And in Spanish, that means mine. But it also, depending on where you are in Latin America, can also be a word to say girl. And so there was this incredibly evocative um, double play. Um, and, and there just isn't a single word in English that can do both of those things. So I think there are these moments of just, ah, oh, you know, but wanting to find another way to do justice to the intent behind it and to finding another place where the language can be flexible in that way. Mm -hmm. I at first interpreted your question in a, in a different way, which is about translation of grief, so not grief about lost translation, but um, it, it kind of over, overlaps. I, I've been working on um, literature written by uh, Japanese American incarceration uh, folks in, in uh, Tule Lake. So this was a, a camp for people who were marked no, no, and loyalty questionnaires and were draft resistors or, or others. And th there's a story by George Nozawa, who was born in the United States but educated in Japan, that's called um, The Father of Volunteers. And it, it imagines uh, grief from the perspective of a, a loyal father who spends who sends three of his sons to war as, as volunteers. And so there's already a kind of imaginative act there. And then the pattern of grief was um, itself a kind of translation. So the, the, what I started noticing was that um, the, the father character was a good Christian and biblical cadence like Job, like book of Job, like rhythm started showing up. And so it was like, oh, this is like what Job sounds like in Japanese, and I can translate back f or into that kind of register in order to get across the sense of like repetition, parallelism, and, and lamentation uh, through, through what that was. So I, I guess it's the inverse, right? It's like a happy solution for horrific gr grief. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I, hi, I, I have a couple of questions. One is about punctuation. So you may decide um, as a, a, a dog's cough is not the right way, that's uh, sick as a dog. But what do you do about punctuation if you disagree or, or it doesn't quite work in English, but it's there? So that's I have a two-part two question. Second question is, what do you think of team translation? The famous PNV for Dostoevsky which everyone says it's uh, much, much better than the original translation. So do you consider that or have you ever tried it? Or So those are the two questions. Uh, punctuation is such a, a great problem that comes up every time. Um, for example, for a dialogue in um, Romance languages, sometimes you have an M dash or these brackets. And in English, it's quotation marks. So if it is, you know, the standard uh, notation in this language, I go standard for standard, that kind of thing. The, uh, st the short story I just read uh, is pretty much in a in, uh, single sentence throughout the entire thing. Comma splices galore. So that was a case that, to me, that was deliberate. If you have a text block be so breathless, so I kept it. In another story that might be, you know, lots of comma splices, but it doesn't seem to be purposeful, it's incidental to that language as opposed to a feature of the story, then it's okay for me to remove. So I, th I think a lot about that. Is it incidental to the language incident, or it is uh, maybe part of the author's style or maybe a feature of the story? And then depending on my decision there, I'm gonna see how I'm gonna carry over. Uh, the other question was about co-translation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I co-translate all the time. I think it's, uh, translation is already collaboration, right? I am already kind of creating this collaborative quilt with somebody else. Um, it definitely invites that dialogue with um, another reader I trust. Uh, so I've, I'm working on a co-translation right now, a book, and it's been lovely to go back and forth and be like, what do you think of this joke? What do you think of this sex scene? <laughs> And just trying to make it work uh, with our voices combined and our strengths combined and checking each other's weaknesses. Um, I feel like Robin has more experience with this than me, so I will just pass it along. I actually agree so 
wholeheartedly with everything Bruno said about punctuation that I'm not going to respond to that question. I, that's exactly how I think about it too. Um, and I'm currently working on a number of co uh, several co-translations and, and I find it really exciting and also heartening. I think there is something that's thrilling but can be really scary about the sort of solitary decision making that goes into translation and I think in something like even the example say of, of, of from the question that was asked previously about you know Mina as a word that can mean two different things and how do you sort of come up with a solution that feels like it respects the intent of the text to be able to have somebody else to make that decision with um, is very reassuring it's it's it, it makes it feel like this more sort of bolstered this more supported process I think it's also a reminder about how local language is even within the own lang the language we're translating into I, I recently have a, a co-translation of a novel with a, and my co-translator is from the UK so it's sort of like a, a translation and a half you know we're sort of there are many many times many more than I was expecting where we had a completely different colloquialism where the sort of the tone of a joke the tone of dialogue was really very very different and it was the book it was published by a press in the UK but they distribute in the US as well so you're thinking about audience in different ways about sort of where is this going to be read how to come up with solutions that ideally sort of feel approachable or recognizable in both places but still respecting how how invariably local it is so that that's been really interesting for me too um, I would maybe just add on to the punctuation thing uh, historically Western styles of punctuation didn't really exist in Japanese along with gendered pronouns in the 1800s and were really a kind of an artifact of translation so people trying to um, imitate Western literature by putting uh, commas, periods, and, and other things into the text. Um, the, in, in play text, some of the things I found difficult to translate and have um, actors come back to me is that one of the innovations in Japanese punctuation is not just an ellipsis, but like a six dot or a 12 dot or like 18 dot ellipses. And it's like when you give an actor that, it's like, okay, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, am I just supposed to like stare off into the distance for 18 beats, right? So that, that's part of the process of like filling that in um, and, and ex exploring what, what the punctuation or rhythm of the language might be. I, I would say that um, my thoughts on co-translation is it, it I, I'm just starting a project with Kenji Liu and Lisa Hoffman Kuroda where we're translating like Dada's poetry from the 1920s by a Japanese American poet and it's, great to have two other folks to go to and say, it's not just me, right? This is really weird. Um, and, and have that, that kind of um, teamwork aspect where I think things can go really awry with co-translation and I've seen this happen a lot with Japanese translation in particular is if one translator is like the native informant of the language and the other is like the target language informant and that just produces like mediocrity, not always, but like it can really, lead to overcorrection of interesting language in the original to make it sound good in English. And I've seen like really abusive, uh, unintentionally so, like all, all good intention, but like, I, I, I'm speechless, uh, just, just like, it, it, it's not good. Like it's better if co-translators at least are starting from everybody having some level of linguistic um, movement between the two languages and not as just like an unequal like, you just tell me what this means and I'll turn it into poetry, right? Like, that, that really should never happen. It's really interesting what you're saying because it makes me think about how uh, all the translators that I know that I talk to about, you know, the, their praxis in a detailed way, even if they don't have a co-translator, they have helpers and co-detectives that they go to when they're sleuthing to get solutions as they're puzzling. Um, and then you made me think also about Elizabeth Bishop's um, project. She edited the first trans, uh, the first book of translations, translated poetry from Brazilian Portuguese into English, and she got a lot of contemporary, well-known poets in English to do the translations. But there was some backstage work um, with an original um, native speaker of the language, but that person wasn't credited. So as you go into sort of um, the history of different translation projects, you often find these kind of invisible workers or artists or craftspeople. Um, Andrew, I wanted to know, do you find yourself relying more and more on rehearsal as an opportunity to draft your translations of theater? Uh, yeah, so uh, especially for, for plays because they're designed to be read out loud and also to be adjusted from script format. Like this happens all the time 
Um, and so, uh, methodologically, I'll translate or transcribe as, as straight as possible and then see what happens. And also ask actors during their first reading to read it as written as much as possible. Because even if something looks weird or unnatural, it can be a good challenge to try to figure out whether or not that weirdness or unnaturalness can, can work, right? That there's a, there's a way of solving that problem with the actor as interpreter of that moment. And so things that I've thought that I would correct or naturalize actually end up working in, in weird ways. This happened with a play that I worked with with Sean Metzger at, at UCLA, which was originally written in English, but English is written by somebody that was born in Japan and her first language was German, second language was French, and third or fourth language was English. So the, the English is really weird. Uh, and asking actors to go through 19th century melodramatic English that may not be quite right was an interesting exercise to see, okay, maybe we can get some of this strange stuff to, to work and it actually might work without us editing it for correcting errors or something like that. Oh, that's so interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I happen to have a small publishing house and uh, I publish my own books and I publish for others. And uh, my second novel, uh, it's uh, uh, the title of The Old Seagull and the Tidewalker. I write in English, but I am Italian, so I wanted to have it done in Italian. Uh, and of course, I understand the language, there was no problem. When uh, I got it translated into Spanish, it was a friend of mine uh, from Mexico, and a, um, a uh, mother speaking uh, tongue Spaniard said, that's too Mexican, we need to redo it. And so that was okay. The, uh, the last thing was, uh, I've got it, I've done it, I got it done in French. And uh, being close to Italian, I understand a little Spanish. Um, I got to understand quite a bit of it. But for example, I use the word children. And in English, children, they could even be 90 years old, they're still your child. In uh, Italian is bambino or bambini, or uh, depending on the age. So a ragazzi, that's also uh, another word for, uh, for child. But then in the French version, uh, she used the word enfant. And my, uh, sp uh, my French speaking uh, fiance said, eh, I think that's wrong in this case. So you kind of end up with, even when you're ready to publish, you still don't have it right. The, uh, to add to the confusion, uh, it also got translated into Russian and I haven't got the slightest idea what they said. So I think these are some of the problems of translations. Yes, there are, there are always so many challenges. Do you, yes, you have a question? Oh no, okay. Hi, so I'm wondering about um, translating anything historic. Like I think you mentioned that you translate stuff from the 20s and I only know songs from that time and there's so many references to local politics or to what was going on in that country and stuff. So how do you prepare yourself for translating something like that? Like how much research do you do? How much about the history do you need to know to not miss anything of these kind of subtle references? That's a great question, and to add to that, also, have you, if you have tackled such a project, have you found yourself tempted to change the register? You know, if it's a certain kind of prose style that is from the 20s, say, and then now, is, is there, do you give yourself permission, or have you ever been asked by an editor to make it contemporary? Um, uh, when I'm translating something more historical, especially when it's something that I wasn't there for, um, I try to get really immersed in the kind of voice of the time. Um, the, like when I translated 80s drug lingo, full of dudes and all kinds of things, it was really fun to see what was uh, the language in the US at the time, but also the Portuguese. And I kind of, I didn't go exactly one for one, 80s for 80s. I, because it is still a contempor contemporary publication, right? The readers won't be the same kinds of readers that would be then. So I kind of had to, um, it's almost anachronistic because it is written right now with language that couldn't have been used in the 80s and that is permissible. It is like within the framework of the genre, translation as a genre, right, that is read in a particular way. Uh, but I do enjoy having a sense of authenticity as long as I know that the authenticity is artifice. I am putting that on like a little magic trick. Um, 
But in terms of research, I do a lot of research. I watched tons of movies. I did like a whole, I create little syllabi for myself and I'm like, I'm gonna do a class on camp. And I did that and it was a lot of fun. Um, and I got to use a lot of it in, in the book. The book also, every single story has references to a variety of songs. So I listened to all of them and then at the end, when we have to do a lot of book promotion and all of that, I, we tried to publish essays or other things at the, around the same time the book's being published to help, you know, the publicity push. So I wrote about some of that research and made playlists so that people could listen to it while reading the book, that kind of thing. That exists as a paratext. You can read the book as is, but you can also, if you are a nerd like me, you know, you can also kind of access the extra material. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. If you're passionate about a project, it's a lot of fun to just go, uh, yeah, head on and, and, and do it all. I think it's, uh, your question is a, is a great reminder about, about research in general as, as part of the translation experience, about just sort of every context involving a certain amount of, of immersion and, and reading and, and, and asking questions, interviewing people, sort of being, really doing uh, your, your homework, you know, in the sense of, um, of the background and, and the world. And I think I've, I've translated mostly contemporary authors and largely books that are set in contemporary times. But one example that's an exception is I, I translated a book of letters by a Puerto Rican poet from the first half of the 20th century. And so her, her poetry, and it wasn't that they had somebody else translating the poetry, but it feels very much in a register of an older time. And they're all met meter, they're all rhymed. It has a sort of declamatory feel. But the letters don't at all. And the letters, you know, they certainly, there is language present that feels a bit more old-fashioned than what we would use now but they feel just like somebody speaking to you and so that felt initially it was a big relief to me and and then it also felt um, intimidating in a different way because you know in the same way that you can hear somebody speaking on the radio from the from the 40s there's an accent there's a phrasing there's a cadence there's a, a certain form of of, exp of of exclaiming or of expressing concern um, that may be very colloquially in a totally recognizable way but they still sort of feel in contact with another time. So I tried to think about that, about sort of what um, the conversational micro shifts um, from age to age and to make it feel very fresh and spoken and at the same time not feel like it's somebody who's writing you an email yesterday. Uh, yeah, I, I think that an, another element of, of that is that it, it's a kind of impossible to be so well read in the, the kind of uh, details and minutia of life in a historical period that the, the, the task of the translator is more like building inductive knowledge through a series of problems that come up, right? Like you, you learn through the process and, and the research problems uh, uh, show up in, in that way, although the, the broad syllabus approach is also <laughs> deeply appealing. Like uh, the examples that come to mind are, there's a scene in the, in the novel where the, uh, the no good husband, during one redeeming moment, recites from memory a Kiyomoto narrative from a kabuki play, and that led to like a three week deep dive into, okay, what is Kiyomoto narrative? How would he have learned it? What would it have looked like in solo performance without a shamisen? Can I find recordings on YouTube of this? If I do, does it match the text? Are there errors involved, right? And no one would ever research this way unless they were presented with this very specific problem. So it, it, it shifts things that way. I'd also say that um, it's, it's about translating in every age for a different readership. So an example that comes up is that there's a, a, a phrase in here, 1920s novel, about a ride-sharing agreement to, uh, you know, a bunch of Japanese workers are going to Hollywood and arrange for a ride-share. My editor said, you cannot use the word ride-share or car-share even though that's exactly the phrase that is in the text and also something that would have been used in the 1920s or 1930s because instantly people will think is not a real 1920s or 1930s word. And so like you have to kind of adjust for what people think is historical, even if it's wrong. But, and uh, Andrew, what did you come up with instead of ride share or car share, what did you use? Uh, they shared a ride, right? Ah. <laughs> like, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, do we have any final questions? Are we good? Oh, we're good. Okay. So, um, thank you everyone for coming. And if you have additional questions, I do think our panelists are friendly, so you can always approach us after. Um, please read translations, and um, thank you again for being here.
Thank you. Just give it up one more time for Andrew, Bruna, Robin, and Magdalena. Thank you so much. You're incredible. Thank you for your patience. Community, thank you for your patience as well. And they'll be here for questions.